I'm Marie Johnston, Education Program Manager here at the Societies. It is my pleasure to open today's webinar brought to you by the Society's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. As you listen, please send in your questions and comments. I'll be monitoring the chat and relaying this information to Eugene Law, who will be our moderator today. Eugene, I will now turn the webinar over to you. Hi, folks, and, and welcome to the webinar, uh, Responding as a Bystander to Harassment, Discrimination, and Bias. I'm Eugene Law. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Delaware and the current ASA, CSSA, SSSA, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, Committee, Educa Committee Education and Training Working Group Chair. That's a mouthful for sure. Um, on behalf of the ASA, CSSA, and SSSA DEI Committee, we are very pleased to be hosting this webinar, which is the third in our webinar series, which we began this year. So, in particular, I'm very excited for this webinar because it'll provide us all with some applicable information and guidance on how to navigate any difficult situations that may arise at our upcoming meeting in St. Louis. And so as we strive to make that meeting as inclusive um, and accessible as possible, um, we're hoping to uh, be able to apply the things that Dr. Deanna Kimbrell will be sharing with us today. So um, to introduce the speaker, Dr. Deanna Kimbrell, She's a visionary executive leader who has helped organizations address some of the toughest issues surrounding people, culture, and leadership in the workplace. Some of her highlights and strengths include organizational and governmental strategy, leadership development, change management, public speaking, coaching, and corporate training. Dr. Kimbrell is a Rochester City School District graduate and also holds a bachelor's degree from the State University at Buffalo in communication and international business a master's degree in communication and marketing from Rochester Institute of Technology, and a doctoral degree in management and organizational leadership from the University of Phoenix. Most recently, Dr. D served as the chief diversity officer and department head of DEI for Monroe County in New York State. Dr. Kimbrell has also previously led workplace strategies for organizations like the Paychex, Sears, and Rochester Institute of Technology, and many other small to medium-sized organizations. Dr. Kimbrell has managed multi-million dollar budgets and built resilient teams, currently leading a team of consultants through the Kimbrell Management Consulting Company that guides organizations through the implementation of structure and strategy leadership around organizational culture and DEI. Um, we are very pleased to have Dr. Kimbrell here today as she is a sought after speaker and subject matter expert on topics such as DEI, organizational culture and leadership. Um, she has a bias for action and is committed to cultivating inclusive environments where everyone has the opportunity to thrive. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Dr. D to um, introduce us to how to respond to bystander harassment, discrimination, and bias. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, Eugene. I am happy to be here uh, with the societies today. Um, and actually uh, for the second year. So definitely excited to be here um, and present this very important topic, um, which always comes up um, and which will come up as you as you all prepare for the upcoming conference. Um, just a little bit of information about me. Eugene has done a great job of um, providing that um, information. But um, so my background is in management organizational leadership. I have uh, worked as a conference um, ombuds person, um, held several roles, and I am from Rochester, New York, and a mother and a social justice advocate. So again, this work is very important to me. It is not only what I do, but how I live each and every day. So as we get started, um, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping and make sure that you all know there are no right or wrong answers. We all are learning and this is a journey. So if you have any questions, comments, or insights, please feel free to share those in the chat and we'll definitely be able to address those. Um, and, you know, talking about these things can uh, be hard. So please have an open mind and have grace for others as well. I also would like to set the tone with some key terms and definitions. So today we will be talking about being a bystander and what that means. And I think we've all been in that situation. We've seen a bad car accident or we've seen a situation play out really bad and we've all been bystanders to it. And usually when we think about a bystander, it is someone who is present at an event or incident but doesn't take part. What I wanna to talk to you today about is how to be active 
in your in bystanding. And that is a person who is present at an event or incident, but takes a part. We can also consider that person an upstander, a person that is courageous enough to offer support at an incident. So these things are, are a little bit different, but very important. And how you respond, how you offer support is also very important so that you don't further harm or make a, a bad situation even worse. Um, and a lot of these things that we're talking about today is really related to diversity, equity, and inclusion and how we all show up in different spaces. So as you all know, diversity are all of the things that exist um, amongst us. It is things that we can see on ourselves, and it is also some of those things that we can't see. So things we can see may be um, our, our race, possibly our gender, sometimes our age, and those things that are biological to us. And then there's also internal things that you can't see that also makes us similar and different, such as um, our religion, our educational background, our veteran status, educational status, so forth and so on. So when we think about equity, equity are, is really all of the tools and resources needed for people of different backgrounds to access opportunity. Equity, when you think about it, it is really similar to FAIR, right? So what is FAIR? Traditionally, when people think about FAIR, they think about giving everyone the same thing, the same tools and the same resources to be successful. However, when we think about equity, we are focusing on giving people the right tools and the right resources to be successful and to gain access to that opportunity that we are all looking for. When we think about inclusion, it really is about providing safe spaces for people of different backgrounds to thrive. So ensuring that people feel safe with who they are, their experiences, but also sharing those experiences is, is very important. When we think about safety um, as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion, being a bystander, um, and also engaging in these incidents, safety is so important. Safety can be your psychological safety and also your physical safety. So it really is those feelings that people have about being safe in the space, psychologically being safe to be who they are, to share their experiences, and physically, um, you know, making sure that there's no physical harm done to them. So that's one thing that we'll also be talking about here in this training. And then harassment and what really is harassment. And it really is unwanted touch or verbal communication that violates our, our human rights. And our, our human rights that based on um, the law are based on things like our race, our gender, our religion, um, and, and several other factors that um, give us that right by law not to be violated or discriminated against. Discrimination is really a prejudgment about a person based on their physical characteristics or group um, that you perceive them to be from. And then when we talk about bias, and bias is something that has been a really hot topic over the last few years, how do we mitigate and how do we reduce bias? The thing about bias is that it is a human condition and it's not all bad, right? Some of our biases allow us to protect ourselves, but in instances when we are working with people, we're making decisions about people, we're engaging and interacting with people of several different backgrounds, it's very important that we check our biases so that we are not alienating, we are not discriminating, we are not marginalizing people of diverse backgrounds just based on false or limited information. I know many of you before have had uh, what is called a gut feeling. And you know, gut feelings can can be right sometimes. Sometimes they're they're not right. But it really is making sure that we're checking what those gut feelings are and the places in which they are coming from and how they may impact others. So our brain is very powerful, and a lot of our biases can be unconscious. So our brain has the ability to take in millions of pieces of information per second, but we can only really process about forty pieces of information per second. So all of that access of information goes to what is called our unconscious brain. So when we are faced with those situations that we have limited information about, we're making gut decisions. And with gut decisions, we can be making wrong decisions. Um, ethic um, in regards to our ethics, our morals, and also the law. So that's why it's so important to understand our biases and start to mitigate them. Again, being biased is a human condition, 
but being able to reduce those and especially when it comes to people is very important. All right, so engaging as a bystander is very important for a few dis dif different reasons and kind of why we are here today. So your engagement as a bystander or active bystander or upstander is important because it supports deeper levels of DEI. So when we create a culture of speaking up about these things, communicating about these things, it creates a, different, a deeper level of equity and inclusion. It supports a safe space for everyone to thrive. So people have the opportunity to talk about these things and they feel safe in talking about these things. It increase, increases awareness. And when people become more aware of their biases and how they are manifesting, we can start to debias some of those things and stop those biases from um, coming up in our communication, our decision-making or our interactions with others. It demonstrates support as an active ally. So being um, someone who is an ally um, of these situations, of these incidents, and as, as it relates to DEI and those different things. It decreases incidents of harassment and discrimination. So again, the more that we are speaking about it, the more people and, and engaging in it and it being a topic of discussion, the less people, the less likely people are to engage um, in these incidents. It supports communication and relationship building, again, having conversations, and it creates a culture of intolerance. So if people know people, if, if people that may be considered a violator or someone that is accused of um, harassment or discrimination or what have you, or, or having some sort of biases, um, they may be less likely to do those things if they know that the culture doesn't tolerate it. People will speak up. There are some um, consequences for it. People are less likely to communicate in that way and engage in that way. Now, we again, we've all been in this situation where we've seen something happen and we had some observations and we decided not to intervene for whatever reason. Um, and, and this has happened in some big you know, incidents, people decide just not to intervene. And it really occurs when there's a lot of people around. So some research on the bystander effect says that people are less likely to engage when there are several people around than they would if there were only a few witnesses. And I think today in our society, we see a lot of people engaging through videotaping it and not really helping and stepping in and being that active bystander, but rather just uh, spreading the incident. So um, there's ways for us to get over that. And it, it really you know, is important that we do because again, there's so many benefits when we think about increasing the presence of inclusion, the opportunity of equity and people feeling safe in all spaces. Um, some reasons people don't get involved is just the social, social influence of others. Um, some people are afraid to get involved. Um, some people feel helpless. Well, there's nothing that I can do. And then again, some there's a personal risk that may be associated with it. I know many of us have heard the term, um, no good deed goes unpunished. So again, some people want to protect, um, you know, themselves and not getting involved in different things. So there's several reasons why people wouldn't get involved, but there's also some great benefits to getting involved as well. All right, so what happens in events where people, excuse me one second, where, where people are have been in situations um, and these incidents occur in the workplace or the educational um, settings is that there is trauma. So there's some sort of trauma and psychological safety issues that come up. And this can happen from one event or a, a several events like microaggressions that happen over time. Our microaggressions are those subtle things that happen that kind of are little slights that happen um, they're very subtle, but over time they build up and they create traumatic experiences for folks as well as some issues with psychological safety. And then we have our really extreme overt things um, 
violence and different things like that, that kind of also trigger some trauma in our STEM, uh, stem from things like discrimination and bias and things of that nature. So there is a big spectrum on where these things lie, but still and yet, none of them are okay in our workplaces, in our educational institutions, it's important that we are addressing them consistently, even the things that seem very small to some of those things that we just can't deny. Uh, the most common effects of workplace trauma can be mental issues, anxiety, and depression, just like any other trauma um, people may have. Uh, physical issues, sleep issues, decreased energy, decreased performance, people stop coming to work, people lack resiliency, they're complaining a lot, and they're just not able to, to live up to their full potential just because of some of the, um, of the trauma that has taken place in that environment. And a lot of times people stay in these environments just because they don't feel as though they have any options. Um, if it is a work environment or educational environment, some people are like, okay, I don't want to lose my job or I don't want to be kicked out of school. So they just don't see the support or the benefit of actually addressing these issues. So a lot of people continue to suffer um, in trauma and, and not feeling psychologically safe, uh, which continues to perpetuate that cycle and, and, and do further damage. So there's several different um, outcomes of continuing to perpetuate these things, not speaking up and, and letting them take place. Okay. So some of the top reasons for workplace trauma is really a toxic environment. So an environment where racism is happening, homophobia is happening, sexism, ageism, harassment, where these things are happening and they're going unaddressed. There is no clear way to address them. And then there's, again, that fear factor as well. So this is kind of where a, a active bystander or upstander is important in helping to create these healthy relationships. If someone is fearful of losing their job, being kicked out of school or what have you, someone that may have a little more power, a little more influence, may be that person that will be the upstander for them um, and allow them to properly address that issue um, and allow them to understand what their their resources are so again there's several ways to to be an active bystander but it's just important to understand the situation and then understand what the tools and resources are in order to support people in these situations so some examples of incidents that may occur so again the microaggressions the microaggressions are the small slights that happen and these happen every day when we're interacting with people we're interacting with people of different backgrounds and our attitudes and our biases are manifested through our communication so we may say things like oh you're so you know articulate um and this might be maybe an African-American woman. Oh, you're so art articulate. I'm surprised, you know, you, you reached this level of success or, you know, what may be meant to be a compliment actually is revealing an attitude that people that look like you or maybe have come from the same place that you have come from, um, you know, you are exceeding these expectations that I may have. And these things happen and I've seen them happen in meetings um, and usually an upstander may say something like well you know actually the the leading group of people that are are receiving college degrees are african-american women so you know so those are some ways that a, a upstander or active bystander can kind of step in and educate in the moment or kind of negate that situation um, a generalization about someone based on race so all people of this particular background behave in this way. And, you know, I've been in these instances and I also use it as an opportunity to educate, whether it's a friend, a family member, a colleague or what have you about this generalization. Um, I say things like, OK, you're making a generalization about this group of people. Um, it actually isn't true. And you're revealing that you may have some bias. Um, a, around this group of people, you know, for whatever reason, and, and have a conversation. It doesn't mean that someone is necessarily being 
um, you know, a receiver of it, but it just does reveal a mindset. And, you know, as, as an upstander, those are some of the things that we can do in those moments, our friends, family, and colleagues in, in trying to educate and negate or even bring awareness to what uh, they are revealing or, or what their communication or their mindset is revealing um, about the biases they may have. Another thing is the sharing of sexual experiences and language. In the workplace, I've seen this come up a lot and maybe two people are having a conversation that they are comfortable with, but it may also be overheard by others in the workplace which makes them uncomfortable and may allow them to file a report or you know what have you so those things even if it isn't the person that is that you're communicating with or that is being communicated with it may be someone who's overhearing so it, it may be something that needs to be reported just because you never know um, how those things are impacting others and it in the inappropriateness of it in the particular workplace Unwanted romantic pursuit. I think we've heard of these different things where, you know, flirting and different things like that are can become a, a form of harassment. If someone is warned, okay, I'm not interested, please, you know, don't do that, but they continue to do that, that is a form of harassment that can cause psychological safety issues and even um, yield some trauma in certain situations. So again, it is very important um, if someone is sharing experiences with you or you see this, that you kind of under seek to understand the situation and then see how you can implement some supports in that. Um, another thing is inappropriate comments about someone's gender identity. So uh, again, there are several different people of several different backgrounds. Um, I've worked with some organizations where people are transitioning genders and there's comments and there's looks and there's stares that people may have. And that can also be a form of discrimination, of harassment. So it's so important to be educated and educate others in, in those incidents to avoid isolating people that are different in those different ways. Uh, not engaging with someone because of their religion. Oh, we don't wanna hire this person because uh, they may be of a Muslim background or we don't want to give this person a, a promotion because she needs to have Saturdays off based on her religion and we need her to work Saturday. So again, those are some ways that uh, discrimination can take place. And if we are in rooms when we hear these things, oh, don't hire her, she's pregnant, or you know, those are all forms of discrimination that can be unlawful. So not only creating a risk to our values and our morals, but also creating a legal risk for the organizations that we are engaging in. So it's very important that in those moments we see and hear things like that, that we use our voice to speak up um, in those moments, whether there's a, a particular receiver or not of these incidents. So of course, this is just some examples. There's several other incidents that will occur. Um, and it's just really, being clear on uh, what it is and what some resources are. I always, the, the biggest issue that I see people have with being a bystander is the fear of speaking up. And sometimes we get frozen in the moment, like, I don't know what to say, I don't know what to do. Um, so again, it is something that is practiced over time. And sometimes it's not always in the moment to offer support. Um, you know, so just figuring out what, what we can do, whether it's in the moment, whether it's not in the moment, to help and address those situations bring and bring awareness. So when and how to intervene. So again, the voice of the active bystander of standard can change the course of action once someone has been violated and also the culture. But we really want to know when. When is the right time to have these conversations? And it, it really starts with understanding that there is a real threat. Um, so ask questions before assuming and getting involved. Understand how the receiver of the threat wants to be supported. So again, if you are doing things that the, the receiver is not comfortable with, you may be causing further harm. So it really is being considerate of that. Understand what available resources, uh, what the, the available resources are within your organization um, and, and different tools in that way. With, um, you may witness inappropriate, unwanted, or violent touch. 
So that does give you the opportunity to find your resources and report. You may witness the exclusion or marginalization of a person or group of people based on who they are. So again, that does allow you to um, put you in a situation where you should report. Sorry if my sharing keeps going off. Um, so there's several, several different situations in which we want to make sure that you know we're being active and if we're saying if we're seeing things we're saying things i've been in a situation um one situation with an organization where people were disqualifying people based on things like their name their address for jobs um name and address and things of that nature and someone spoke up and you know they they told the appropriate parties but without that person speaking up and letting management or what have you know that this was happening there will be no way to address it. Nobody would know, and these things will continue to perpetuate. And, and down the line, if it is discovered, it can create a legal risk for the organization. So it, it's very important that you, know, you are communicating when you are seeing these things done, when there is an intentional lack of diversity, clear example of that, when you witness people being harassed, you hear inappropriate comments that violate civil rights, Again, things like, oh, don't hire this person because they go to church on Saturday or things like that. You hear a witness violence or abusive language. So again, that is going to that other end of the spectrum where we want to get those things addressed right away. You observe biased decision making. You observe inequities uh, taking place. And you ensure you have the permission. So if there is a situation where there is an immediate um, receiver you make sure you have their permission to share those experiences or if someone is uh, coming to you with a particular incident you get their permission thanks for sharing that with me do i have your permission to share this with um the equal opportunity person the ombuds person or what what have you uh, so make sure that you do have those permissions in place Okay, so responding as a receiver or even as um, someone who has been accused of these things can be very tricky for everybody involved. Um, it's important that the receiver feels safe to share their experiences and they have a way to do that. And there, there's there been some things intentionally put in place so that they, they can do that. Um, and additionally, as the accused, if the violation was unintentional, it's important to be open-minded to developing more awareness. So we talked about bias earlier, and we talked about how it can be unconscious, right? So we're all human. These things will happen. That's why it's so important to already be proactive in, implement, in implementing uh, different strategies to address them. But with our unconscious brain, we, we are likely to fall into a bias trap at some point, sometime, no matter who we are. And when it is unintentional, we wanna make sure that we have that open mind to course correct um, when we can. Sometimes it's not always unintentional. So when we talk about those overt things that happen, those things are, un are unintentional. Therefore, they may need to be handled in a different way. Um, and you know, getting getting the appropriate parties or officials involved in order to handle those things. But I will say, for the most case, it is unintentional, and it does require a conversation, relationship building to get back on track. So the receiver, it's important to find a safe space and trusted allies. Share your truth. Don't blame yourself. Understand your needs and let go of the fear. The biggest thing that gets in the way of us addressing our issues as they relate to DEI, harassment, discrimination, and bias is that fear that we have, that fear of you know not being heard, not being accepted, nothing happening. So we want to let go of that fear and be courageous in those moments. As the accused, you want to be empathetic, willing to learn and listen, confront your biases, which is a really hard thing for all of us to do because they're deep seated into who we are, um, how we were raised and things of that nature. So be willing to have that willingness to confront the biases that are being presented to us 
open to resolution. And then the best way is to really uh, change that behavior that we had that is manifesting that bias or uh, making discriminatory decisions. Remember, anyone can be a receiver, an accused or an active bystander. So think about um, in, a, in different power dynamics between a student, a professor, a supervisor, a, a, a um, a worker, a co-worker, what have you. So those power dynamics can occur in these situations, which also can contribute to fear and unwillingness to share your story. If you are feel like you are being discriminated against by your supervisor, you may not be willing to share that with others because they may have the power to retaliate. Uh, one of the biggest um, reasons for workplace lawsuits is retaliation. So it's very important that the Institute have something in place that makes people feel safe. So that goes to that psychological safety and, and ensuring that these things can be properly handled through a process. So no matter who you are in an organization, these things can take place. And the best thing to do, especially when they are unintentional, is making sure um, you know, that you, you do some um, resolution, some restorative practices in order to maintain that relationship. So after an event has occurred, communication and, re and rebuilding the relationship is very important. So in most cases, this can be done, right? This can be done. Um, and it starts with having a conversation of all of the parties involved, as well as someone to facilitate that conversation, whether it is your HR representative, your DEI person, your ombuds person, or what have you, but having a place, a safe place, and someone to facilitate this discussion. And in this discussion, talk about things like intent versus impact. So again, when we talk about our biased brain, it may not be our intent to discriminate, to alienate, to marginalize people. However, when it happens, we really have to consider the impact that we're having on others. So the impact that we're having on others is always going to trump our intent. So it's not like, oh, I didn't intend it to mean that way, but this is what happened. This is how you impact, impacted me and it can never happen again. So it really is about holding people accountable for that and understanding the impact that they're having, which contributes to their awareness. Uh, why the violation was inappropriate. So we want to make sure that that is understood. We go through the process of people becoming aware of their biases. So this is something that she said, it was a microaggression and it's revealing that you don't value people of this particular background. Um, and you know, usually that is not what people uh, mean, but we want to make sure that we make them aware of what um, their communication, what they did and what it reveals about their thinking ways to communicate more respectfully moving forward. What does change behavior look like? And I think the number one thing is apologies. So many times I see people wanting just to be heard, have a safe space to communicate. So apologizing and really being empathetic and sincere is always a good way to start to heal after these incidents. And if, if it is applicable consequences, so what are the consequences? Is this something that happens all the time with this person? Have they decided that they weren't going to change their, their behavior or the way that they're interacting? Um, or is it severe enough that there needs to be an immediate consequence? So again, each case is going to be different, but these are just some ways to rebuild after this has happened. All right, so we want to make sure that we are protecting privacy, confidentiality, um, and, and not perpetuating future harm when these things come up. So it, it really is important as a bystander that you understand what your role is and how you can support. What are the tools? What are the resources available to you? Um, sharing those with the receiver, ensuring they know that you are a trusted ally always ask permission on how you want or think you should proceed. Protect the privacy unless the privacy of the receiver and, and, and the accused 
unless you are giving uh, the permission to do so or how. So make sure you're checking in with that first. Report observations to the appropriate parties. So you don't want to go out trying to fix things yourselves. There are professionals to do that and allow them to, pro to properly do that. You do your part. When you see it, you speak out. You, you speak to spread awareness in the right places. And that will allow us to reduce stigma. So when we think about being an ally, usually an ally is someone offering support. And sometimes that's the best that you can do, offer support, offer resources. Sometimes you do have the ability to step in in the moment and use your voice um, and help to co course correct or educate. That's more what we consider an accomplice. When we are someone who is just you know, going off and doing the things that we want to do, doing what we feel is right, no consideration of the other, other people that are involved, that may kind of come off as being a savior. So someone that is doing it for their own personal reasons, they want to be seen as a hero. And I think that's uh, something that we definitely want to stay away from. We want to make sure that we are offering support the way in which people need to be supported. And we're pointing them in the right direction. We're not trying to solve it ourselves, but we are letting them know that that they have the support that they need. All right, so that brings me to the end of this presentation. Um, the, the chat is open if anybody has any questions, insights, want to share any experiences, that would be great. All right. Uh, thank you for that presentation, Dr. Kimbrell. I do have a few questions that have come through in the chat, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible in the next few minutes. Um, so the you you did speak to this during the presentation, but one of the more important questions that we we've get, gotten frequently is how do you overcome the fear of being retaliated as the bystander um, intervening in a situation? Um, if there is a um, power dynamic between you and the person that might be uh, the accused in that situation, um, how would someone um, navigate a situation like that? Thank you, Eugene. That is a great question, right? Because it, it is really difficult and it really is up to the organization to work to create that culture because that's a culture thing. That is the culture of the organization and it is a culture of fear and retaliation. So if someone is feeling that way, it really is up to the organization to put in the proper measures in order for those things to be properly handled and make sure that it is shared with those who are um, engaged in that organization. So people know what their options are, who to go to and what the process looks like um, and they feel safe. So it really is up to the organization to create those safe spaces for people uh, to share those experiences. All right. Um, another question we got is um, related to um, self-reporting by the people affected by an incident. Um, do you have any insight into the likelihood that, or the, the, the frequency that people actually do report these incidents uh, to the organization? Um, and if we can rely on things like surveys to understand if there are incidents that are happening um, within the societies that we might not be aware of, or even those anonymous surveys might have some level of um, inaccuracy or people choosing not to report through even something like that. Uh, yes, I don't have the exact statistics in which people are willing to report issues. It is definitely a low number people are less likely to report issues if they are engaged in an organization that has not yet developed a culture of reporting those issues so people would be less likely to report um however the societies has and susan will talk about this a little bit later but the society has developed some measures to create that safe space where people can report incidences that are happening at the conference and things like that. And those things do get looked at, those things will get addressed. Um, and there's several different ways to, to report, to protect your privacy, um, whether it is anonymous or what have you, or in, to share your experiences. So um, what the societies have in place, Susan will we'll talk about that um, next. Okay. Um, a quick one. I think 
Um, we only have a few minutes left for questions, but um, do you have any suggested phrases to use if you witness something and you want to just step in without potentially um, magnifying the issue? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on the level. So we talked about a spectrum of things. It may be things like a microaggression and you see people, you know, saying things that are, are biased. You can step in and say, well, actually, or even maybe someone from a marginalized group being talked over in a meeting and you know so you can advocate for people in in that moment or you see microaggressions you can kind of step in to educate well actually people of this background are you know what have you or actually that's not a true generalization or actually you know that's a bias um but in the in the more severe uh, instances you really want to check and understand what the threat is um, you may want to ask the receiver, do you need do you need any support or, you know, things of that nature. So, again, the way in which you are responding may really depend on what the situation is. If there is no immediate receiver and you overhear people talking, um, you, you can intervene in that moment and provide some suggestions as to how their communication may be biased. Or you may just want to report it, like I talked about, someone making biased decisions based on names and location, that person went and they just reported it to the appropriate parties. So I think it really is understanding and assessing the situation. Okay. Well, let me take a closer look at what's coming in here. Um, so uh, this is maybe a tricky one, but uh, we know that in, in different um, organizations, different environments there may now be um situations where there may not be the same level of institutional support for diversity equity inclusion and there might actually be limitations on what types of language or what types of actions someone might be able to take within that organization do you have any thoughts or suggestions for effective strategies to navigate and support people being affected by discrimination or bias in those those situations yeah, absolutely. So we've seen in our society, um, you know, these things change in organizations based on the state you live on, so forth and so on. So it can be tricky. However, there are federal laws, human rights laws that we all have. And when those things are violated, we do have the opportunity to have those things addressed um, and bring bring forth our concerns um, with, with that organization by law. So I think it really is understanding what your rights are. There is an EEOC website that will allow you to do that. And if you feel as though your, your um, human rights have been violated because of things that are biological to you, race, gender, um, things well, like your religion and um, a few several other things, uh, you can go on the website. I don't have it in front of me, all the things. It's, few of them, but um, you can definitely address those. And each organization, especially higher education institutes, should have um, an EEO uh, representative and someone that handles um, harassment, sexual harassment. So I think that's in most all organizations. Um, so that might be your first point of contact. If there isn't um, a DEI or ombuds, you should at least have um, an EEO Title IX, I believe, representative to handle those issues of harassment and discrimination. Thank you. So I'm, I'm trying to parse a, a longer comment here about um, how to manage, how to intervene or report everyday derogatory comments that might be made by coworkers, um, maybe that are um inappropriate or unprofessional but not necessarily within um the well sorry this is a longer comment like it doesn't um, arise to the level of harassment or discrimination and it might not be directly to an individual just things that yeah. people are saying in their own conversations that are over her yeah, yeah. absolutely 
And I think those are the things that we'll, we'll experience the most are those things that, you know, are just coming up in conversation and it's revealing attitudes. And that goes to the culture. Um, that should be something that should be reported to the leader, should be reported to HR, and it should be handled as a cultural issue. Um, and, and if you're in an environment that is promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion, and you know, those different things, just a good workspace, no matter who you are, those things should not be tolerated. So that is something um, that the leaders, um, HR and so forth and so on should be addressing in order to have a good, healthy workplace. And so um, several of these, these questions, you've responded that the organization is responsible to have these, these systems in place. If um, you find that the organization might not have um, things currently, what would you say is the best way to, um, you know, advocate for changes to be made in the organization that could then lead to changes in culture? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think, you know, what, what, what you do, Eugene, and what you're a part of is a committee. So forming a committee, letting your organization know these are important for me. These things are important for me to not only work here, but to thrive here. Um, and I, these are some of the things that people, people like me or what have you um, want to have addressed. So I think it really is um, kind of starting things from grassroots, starting um, the committees, bringing awareness um, and informing the organization of what's happening and also how it's impacting people. So it does really start with using your own voice. Okay, I think that covers the questions that we've had in the chat thus far, and I think we're also um, at that time where we should turn things over to Susan to allow Susan to tell us more about the specific initiatives that will be taking place in St. Louis. Eugene? Yep. Can you, okay, wonderful. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to share my slides. Okay, thank you, Deanna, for your presentation. Um, as Eugene noted, uh, this webinar is part of a series we're concluding this year and we'll be building on for next year. And it's part of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Initiative that's part of the Tri Society's Collaborative DEI program. So just a quick overview before I jump into um, the information for the annual meeting. Um, the initiative itself is comprehensive across everyone who's connected with our societies. That includes our members, certificates, leadership, staff, and we're really uh, using the initiative to foster change. So we have a more robust platform for innovative ideas to solve the problems facing our communities and our planet. Uh, ensuring opportunities and inclusivity for all and providing richer connections to each other. So as part of the first phase of the initiative, um, a DEI member survey was conducted in the spring of 2021. And from one of the questions, we learned that 17% of participants noted that they've personally experienced some discrimination in the societies. And while many noted that this discrimination happened in the distant past, we know any discrimination is too much. And while the question was open-ended, meaning it could have occurred in many ways from annual meeting to publications, leadership, member interactions, and more, we do know that ensuring that the in-person annual meeting is a safe space is a priority. So therefore, uh, the recommendations report, which was approved by the ASA, CSSA, and SSA boards of directors, calls for a focus on 10 recommendations. The first and in priority order, focuses on professional conduct and anti-harassment policy development. And there's two components um, to this recommendation. The first is the formation of an ethics committee to update our policies and develop investigation and resolution guidelines. Uh, this committee was recently approved by the three boards and is being formed right now. Secondly, the report requires the establishment of a society-wide ombuds program 
ensuring that reporters of harassment are safe and have emotional support. With a program launch prior to the 2022 annual meeting. So we launched the program in 2022 in Baltimore, and it provides us with a foundation for our DEI and safe space initiative, which I'm going to overview for you. So you heard from Deanna. With her assistance, a working group of the DEI committee, which is co-chaired by Augustina Bohr and Cam Anderson, developed a multifaceted plan for the Baltimore annual meeting so that any attendee had options to reach out to report incidents, concerns, or simply would like to talk about DEI issues. Uh, we launched the program in 2022 and are enhancing it for the St. Louis meeting. So we'll be communicating the availability of Deanna as our DEI and safe space advocate on site to meeting attendees in a number of ways. First, to reiterate our zero tolerance policy, a message from the three society presidents will go out to attendees in an informational email the week prior to the meeting. Uh, there'll also be information on contacting Deanna and it's posted on the annual meeting DEI and sustainability webpage. It's also going to be available via the online program and through the meetings app. In addition, you'll see it on the slides that are in the loop that plays at the start of every session and on signboards in the convention center. So let's do a quick walkthrough of the options for contacting Deanna. And I'm going to move my web page over here. So can everybody see my, I hope everybody can see the annual meeting website. Yep, Eugene, can we you see confirm? It. Okay, thank you. So there's a couple places where you'll find information on how to reach out. The first is, <clears throat> excuse me, the, and the primary place where the information is, is under about the meeting, DEI and sustainability webpage. Uh, you'll see a statement. Um, what and what constitutes, um, you know, reasons that you might want to report an issue or seek guidelines on an incident. Uh, we put a couple of here: harassment, uncomfortable experiences, a lack of inclusion and respect, biased behavior and microaggressions, unwanted touches, over friendliness, and inappropriate jokes, just to name a few. So. Deanna can be reached in the following ways, via the app, um, and you'll go from the general information to the health and safety section. She will be available by phone and by text with these hours. And Jim Cudahy, our society CEO, uh, will also be available 24 hours a day. And his phone number will be is listed here and will be listed here for the entire meeting. And we know that people like to reach out in different ways, maybe at different times, depending on their comfort levels. You'll be able to email Deanna. We'll have a contact form that can be done anonymously. You can request a meeting, or she will also be available um, with office hours in room 111 of the convention center. So someone I know had asked a question about uh, reporting and Deanna will be preparing a report uh, four weeks after the annual meeting with generalized information uh, so that we know what the experiences were and to, to be able to track uh, if we're having a lot of incidents or none at all, which is our hope. Um, and you can also find it in the online program. Briefly, I'll show you where that is. In the general information section, meeting information, DEI and safe space advocate. And this additional contact information goes back to the page that I just showed you. But we're putting the key inform contact information here. Um, it's in the where is and also in the health and safety. And the app, the meeting app, which we'll launch this week, mirrors this um, information you're seeing right here. this back up. So I also wanted to just really briefly uh, mention that the annual meeting DEI sessions can be found in the online program and in the app. We're going to be having a diversity summit on Monday from 2 to 4.30. We'll have a showcase poster session and a research poster session in the exhibit hall. 
And there is a complete list of them on the, the page, the DEI and sustainability page that I just showed you. Oops, apologies. I also mentioned the recommendations report, and I know someone else also asked about uh, reporting. And these uh, pages, the agronomy.org slash diversity, crops.org slash diversity, and soils.org slash diversity have our DEI statement, our recommendations report, our survey report, and there's also a feedback link. You can report an incident, you can provide suggestions or comments. And with that, I thank you for your time. I look forward to seeing all of you in St. Louis and I'll turn it back over to Eugene for any questions. Yes, um, I don't think we have any questions um, about what you presented, Susan, at least not yet. Um, there is one question I received about um, reporting um, harassment by a professor outside of SSSA. Um, and while um, we feel for that person who's being affected by that incident, I think that any reporting of that incident would most likely have to happen institutionally. Um, if it's not within our organization, then we don't really have any purview over it or any way to address the situation. So. Um, if anyone needs support in that, and um, I, I would be willing to help you navigate that process, although, um, so feel free to reach out to me. Um, I believe my contact information is on the DEI page of the Society's website. Um, Great. And I and would then, say other ways might be, you know, contacting a mentor. Right. Uh, you know, uh contacting maybe talking in generalities with uh you know another colleague or i think as deanna has mentioned before there are a lot of resources available on campuses um not not just for reporting but to actually sit down and get advice on how to navigate so right and and what i'm offering is maybe to help people you know, research their options in those situations because you know without having those specific it's very it's some Times it's very difficult to even find that type of information depending on the institution. So yes, definitely handling that um, locally would make ha most likely have the most significant outcome. Um, so we do have a question in the chat for sharing the link to the DEI survey report. Um, that is available also on the the website under the DEI um, tabs for each of the societies. So if you go to agronomy.org and then look for the DEI webpage, the reports will be available there. Right. Can you see the agronomy.org slash diversity, crops.org slash diversity, and soils.org slash diversity. Soils also has a soils.org slash gender, which has um, gender reports from the inclusivity committee that has been doing work in that space and beyond. Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions come in here. So um, thank you all for attending. Um, we appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to be with us here and to um, learn about how you might be able to make an impact by being an active bystander at our meeting in St. Louis. Um, I'd like to thank both uh, Dr. Kimbrell and Susan for uh, their presentations today and I would remind you all to keep a lookout in your email for a very short survey on this webinar. Um, we'll send that out shortly and we do hope that you'll respond to that. That does help us um, get some feedback on our webinar series and the education and training that we are providing to the membership. So we appreciate any feedback that you're willing to provide and um, we look forward to seeing you all in St. Louis in just a few short weeks here. So um, thanks again and goodbye and have a great day. Thank you everyone. See you in St. Louis. Bye everyone.